Hey, good morning, everyone. My name's Scott. I'm uh, one of the staffers here, and excited to be with you on this Palm Sunday as we wrap up our sermon series, How to Pray, looking at the final clause of How to Pray, and hopefully think a little bit about Palm Sunday, the intersection we find ourselves in the church calendar, and look ahead towards both the reality of Good Friday and, and our part in that in the season of Lent, and the truth of the resurrection that we celebrate here uh, coming up on Easter Sunday. There is a lot coalescing into this one moment. And the hope is that as we think about temptation and we think about evil, that it helps us think and pray more to the Father who is a guide through both. And so um, let's pray together now towards that end. Jesus, thank you so much for uh, your church, for your people. We thank you for this prayer you gave us 2,000 years ago. We thank you that the reality of your goodness and our request for provision also have the truth baked into it that we will face temptations, every one of us a little bit different. And God, would you align us under the goodness of the Father's love for us today so that when obstacles come, when evil is faced, we will turn and face your heart for us. We love you and all God's people said, Amen. The Lord's Prayer, teach us to pray. Our sermon title today is the same thing. Teach us to pray. Wrap up as we look at this final clause. Uh, this is the greatest prayer of all time. We've said it before in the series. It's just so fascinating to me that when you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the one thing the disciples ask concretely is, Jesus, can you teach us to pray? Because there's something in his prayer life, there's something in this prayer life that is the secret of really knowing God and being filled with his spirit. The, the early church was so committed to the Lord's prayer that it was baptism that signified the confession of faith and it would be the Lord's prayer they would pray together. So though we don't need to say this exact prayer every day, every single day Jesus said we should be praying in such a way that looks like this, including that we would be every single day thinking about our temptations and thinking about the reality of evil in the world, forces that pull us away from the Father's heart. So when we say, hallowed be your name, which is the beginning of the prayer, and then the reality of evil, it's like all of human history is housed within these few lines. We rest into God's power to find our source of deliver us. Deliver us from evil, God. Evil. Is there evil? I mean, systemically, yes, you know, but it's not something we see on the everyday. Maybe it's, you know, movies at Halloween time. I mean, you know, we don't, we're not that in touch with evil in the everyday experience. And I think for a lot of Christians in the West, we have an undernourished a reality about the presence of evil in the world. Right now, what's happening, it's quite inspiring, actually, the rise of Christianity in the global south. So it's in Africa, in Asia, in India, in South America, and even into Central America. The church is actually growing in to the point that they're saying that Christianity is on the rise around the world. And you might ask, well, how can that be? Because oftentimes in the pulpit, other things, maybe in the Seattle Times, the New York Times, we're, we're hearing about the democracy of Christianity, but that's a very, that's a Western European lens because it's in the Western, in Western nations that the church attendance is kind of plummeting. But in general, around the world, actually Christianity is growing and it's growing in places that are most aware of the battle between the forces of good and evil. If you travel or do ministry or receive ministry in Central South America, India, Africa, you know, it won't take you long to realize that people, particularly in Africa right now, they talk about evil every single day in order to be leaning on God and not fall prey to forces of evil. They, you know, it's a very much a reality. It's like a, there's a witch doctor in our village or the village over. So when it's not raining, they don't think, oh, I hope we get different weather patterns. They actually believe there are forces against God in the world. But here in the West, we have an underformed theology of evil. And that's where I think in different times, historically, they could, you know, different Christians would look into what's happening historically and just see evil as an everyday reality. A little bit easier than maybe some of us today. The Christian, Christian theologian Helmut Thielich, he, he looked into the destruction of World War II in Europe, and he just said it very clearly, and he preached a sermon, deliver us from evil. 
It's just so clear to him when he looks in the world. Same thing for Martin Luther King. He wrote a sermon in 1956, not like dancing between like, well, is evil, you know, baked into the systemic oppression that he was leading change against? It was just his everyday reality. And King wrote in 1956, there's hardly anything more obvious than the fact that evil is present in the universe. It projects its nagging tentacles into every level of human existence. We may debate over the origin of evil, but the only person, but only the person victimized with a superficial optimism will debate over its reality. Reality. Evil is with us as a stark, grim, and colossal reality. So, in a sense, the whole history of life is between a history of a struggle between good and evil. And so we might, as, as Christians in, in you know, 2023 Seattle, be like, well, what is the evil of the everyday experience? I'm telling you, and Jesus is telling you in the Lord's Prayer, that we should be every day thinking about that which is tempting us to go away from the Father heart, and then every single day asking in prayer for God to protect us from evil because it is going on, friends, around us. It was C.S. Lewis who once famously said, every square inch, every split second is claimed by God but then counterclaimed by Satan. And the word Satan just literally means the evil one, the enemy. And so today, we're looking at the power of prayer in order to, um, it's kind of a, a practice that we can employ when we're tempted, not if. When we face evil, not if. Christian author Mark Battison says like this, prayers are prophecies. They're the best predictors of your spiritual future. Who you become is determined by how you pray. So ultimately, the transcript of your prayers becomes the script of your life. We're a praying church. We're believing of the power of prayer. So when we face evil, when we face obstacles, we need to be people turning to prayer instead of towards our own effectiveness or our own resources. And in this way, worship and prayer is a posture of trust and dependence that we can lean on in any challenge. So today we're gonna look at three pretty simple aspects that prayer is powerful for keeping us strong. That's kind of the lead us not part. Prayer is essential for keeping us safe. That's the deliver us part. And prayer is winning the battle for our hearts where Jesus just kind of says amen over this whole enterprise. So let's begin here. Prayer is powerful for keeping us strong. Matthew 6, 13a. Lord, lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into. It's a little bit, uh, difficult to translate the Greek into the English here, so it reads a little bit awkward. The last line of the greatest prayer ever, lead us not. Interesting language, maybe a little bit even problematic because it raises the question for a listener, does the Father lead us into dark places if we don't pray this? Does the Father tempt us? The Greek word for temptation here is this word parasmon, which is a test, a trial, a temptation. It's a noun, which I find interesting, not a verb. It's not an ongoing forever situation, but in every situation, there is a temptation to make alternative choices. And so we know theologically that Jesus won't tempt us. That's not who Jesus is. That's not what the Father does. Some might say, well, wasn't Jesus led into the wilderness where his temptation occurred by the Spirit? It was, because in the wilderness, we can be formed. In the wilderness, we can be strengthened. In the wilderness, we may face temptations. We will face temptations. But God doesn't tempt us. That's not what God does. He can use temptations to strengthen us. He can lead us into places that will form us and forge us. But we believe that God is good all the time. This is what James said was read to us earlier. When tempted, no one should say, and again, when tempted. Not if you're good. Like, every day we're tempted. That's what being a Christian is. No one should say, God is tempting me. God cannot be tempted by evil. It's not in his nature, it's not in his character. Nor does he tempt anyone, that's not in his will. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own even evil desire and enticed. So to understand the nature of the temptation, it's important to look at a biblical literary device Matthew often employed in his gospel called a chiasm. I'm gonna take you into a kind of a deep dive of a seminary 101. A chiasm is a literal technique used in the Bible, used often in the Psalms, used often in Matthew's gospel, where ideas are presented in a chiasm in order and then repeated in reverse order in order to emphasize something in the middle. So, an example. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. The emphasis, how to be tough. Another example from Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. And these tend inward towards me, and I tend outward towards them. The emphasis is on self and identity. 
JFK said, ask not what you can do for your country, ask what your country can do for you. You have a part to play, and I'm pretty sure I just said that wrong, but just go with me. But <laughs> it's like, that's not what your note said. <laughs> so we're moving on, but it's a chiasm. So there is a chiasm in the Lord's Prayer. Daryl Johnson, who was Heather and I's pastor at Glendale Presbyterian in uh, Glendale, California in the 90s, then went on to Regent. Just, he's done some of the best work around the Lord's Prayer. And he says this prayer covers the whole gamut of, of human history in one prayer. And he says, without a doubt, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew's Gospel is built in a chiastic structure. There are seven petitions, carefully and chiastically arranged. The first three focusing on God, the last three focusing on our response. So the emphasis of the Lord's Prayer is in the middle where Jesus says, pray in this way, you know, on earth as it is in heaven, that we are kingdom bringers. We are people filled with God's spirit. We are disciples, that we are called to be bringing heaven to earth every single day. And to pray for heaven to come to earth is to ask things of God and then repeat the demand of ourselves. And so if the flow of the prayer is God before us, it's more critical to learn as we hallow his name, we are led in certain impacts from that behavior. It's you, you, you at the beginning of the chiasm, and then us, us, us. So then the question is, like, how is, if, if these clauses relate to each other, how does your name, Father, what is that, how is that connected to lead me not into temptation, or don't let me fall into temptation? How are they connected? And it's very much, and this is what Daryl Johnson says, I, I love it, I'm repeating it back, we will thrive When the Father's name is treated with dignity in our own hearts first and in the world. We will thrive when his name is hallowed. When we hallow the Lord in prayer and worship, by hallowing, it becomes deliverance from temptation. Isn't that good? It's like... So how we're led not into temptation is we hallow the Lord's name. We become people of prayer. We become people of worship. We become people filled with his spirit. Not just thinking, but living, acting, doing, moved by his presence. People hallowing the name of God. This is the secret when temptations fell. It's like, well, isn't that a little bit of just, that's too easy. I'm tempted. I'm going to just hallow the name. Friends, it's the secret that Jesus gives you. That when you're tempted, not if, we, we turn in worship and prayer to be hallowers. The hallowers, the temptation is about the name of God, Johnson says. The evil one seeks to distort the name and character of God in order for us not to trust the Father. Because the kingdom of God is all about relationships. The restoration of strained and broken relationships through the power of God's grace. This is insanely important for us. That most of the temptations we'll face every day are about distorted relationships. Distorted relationships with God, distorted relationships with our family of origin, distorted relationships with a spouse or a loved one, distorted relationships at our school. And when relationships get distorted, we start to turn and start to hallowing God's name into feeling better by our own devices. But Jesus says, when you pray, lead us not into temptation, we're actually saying, Lord, can you keep me strong today? Can you keep me on point today? Can you keep me tr- hollowing your name today instead of this you know, God of my own devices? And every one of us will be tempted at our own place of need because of our own brokenness and our own identity. What kind of temptations do you face? They're different than mine, but I'm faced with a ton of temptations too. Every one of us is tempted. It is, to be human is to be tempted. There can be temptations of the flesh, So like in this bucket, places like lust and pornography, drinking and drug, like anything of, you know, and we go on and on and on, but those are fleshy temptations. But that's not the only one. That's often where our mind goes to, but there's whole other categories. Temptation can be relationship distortions of anger, self-centeredness, arrogance, lack of humility. Temptation can be of stewardship of selfishness and hoarding, gathering up and not spreading out. Temptation can be of misplaced authority, which leads us into places of busyness and isolation and withdrawal. Depending on our story and our identity, each of us faces different temptations. So as Jesus followers, what we need to do is not judge others' temptations. That's not what Jesus is doing here. But say, Lord, reveal in me where I'm, I'm being tempted. Help me with my self-awareness. 
Lead me not into temptation. God, I know you'll never tempt me, but keep me strong from falling in that place of temptation that's uniquely geared by the enemy at my place of brokenness, at my place of need. And if you can understand your temptation, you will understand where you need more of God's authority in your life. Do you get that? That's huge. If you can understand your temptation, you'll understand more of where you need more God's authority in your life. All of us, and again, you can kind of feel the air get thin in here a bit when we talk about temptation, but it's real, but we're in this together. So if we're praying, Lord, lead me not into temptation, we're also praying, give me an awareness of my brokenness so that when temptation comes, I'm not surprised by it, and that's the place where I need more God's authority in my life, over the flesh, over the money, over the relational dissonance, over the gaps of trusting him. So this is really, really key. But it's our failures and our weaknesses, our emptiness, where we can learn to avail ourselves to the good Father to lead us out of the storms that we face. It's when we come to the end of ourselves that we're finally ready ready to say, Father, hallowed be your name. Lead me not. Lead me not. I was a fishing guide for years, and part of the guide work, you are a leader, You are leading people into places of safety and security or adventure. We have different guides in the room. I was a fishing guide. So part of the job is like, see if you can catch fish today. But what was essential in the job is don't let anybody die today. Don't lose any of your clients. It's really, really important for the business model that everyone that you take out on the boat comes back at the end of the day. And we were in kind of a remote experience. We used to run on the shoulders of our season, even further out than the kind of base camp that we operated about 100 days a summer in, and we would operate for a couple months in the deep, deep wilds of the inlets of British Columbia, up between Night, Incl- Night Inlet and Kinkham Inlet, and these are very, very remote areas where you could go 100 or 200 nautical miles without seeing any other humans, and there's no communication. Cell phones, forget about it. The only thing that might work is a sat phone, but even there, it's hard because the canyon walls are so high, it's hard to get a signal, and in our boats, they were equipped not with sat- satellite phones, but with VHF radio, and that you pretty much need a two-mile point-to-point. Very hard to communicate. So there's three of us that were leading clients out that day, and we got out all day, and we went further than we expected, and we burned a bunch of fuel, and we had to get back to the base camp before nightfall. And then the wind started to blow. And the wind coming through the canyons was being amplified by the canyon walls. I was farther off than the other guys, and I got really, really scared. Because I looked down at my fuel gauge and I was darn near empty. And then the wind blew and going into the storm, there was only one way to go. The fuel continued to go down. The storm continued to rage. Water now coming over the top. My guests looking at me like, are we going to be okay? And I'm like, yeah, no. You know. (laughs) And it was getting worse. And it's amazing, isn't it, that when the storms get stronger, our prayer lives tend to increase in equal measure. I started to really pray, and I started to reach out to the other guides. Even though I didn't think they could hear me, I was like, if I don't tell them I'm not going to make it, we actually were in real trouble. We were being blown up the inlet, no humans, rock walls. There was not a good place to beach the boat. It was that point of the storm. Where will we beach the boat? And then my voice got through. And one one of my other leaders, one of my other guides, Roland, He heard me, you know, scratch your, he came. He came through the storm, but to travel towards me, he had to put his own safety at mine, and now he got a bridle harness on me, and he's towing me into the storm. Now he's burning three times the fuel he would have burned alone. He's watching the fuel gauge, storm raging on. Reveal, we made it. We didn't die that day. But it's amazing how our prayer lives increase when we, the adversary we face. Every single one of us will be tempted to the point of our need. We must do this self kind of introspection by prayer to say, God, help me understand the nature of my temptation and may that be a place for my discipleship to grow. Lead me not into temptation. Second, prayer is essential for keeping us safe. Prayer is essential for helping deliver us from the evil one. Matthew 6, 13b but deliver us from the evil one. The prayer starts with the Father, ends with the evil one. In between, we're called to be bringers of heaven on earth. 
The Greek here for deliver is a word for rescuing and saving and salvation. So God, will you be our salvation? Will you be our rescue when, not if, we face evil on the daily? First Peter 5 says it like this, and Peter understood this because he was one of the last to write down his, you know, his letter before facing martyrdom. And Peter was watching Christians being fed to the lions because of evil. So what Peter said in 1 Peter 5, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And for Peter, that's not just a play on literary device. He was watching his friends be served to the gladiators and to lions in the Colosseum. And he was horrified. But he said, this is what it is to be a Christian. There is evil. Stop denying it. Stop putting your head in the sand. Stop thinking it only exists over there or back when King was writing about systemic racism in the 50s. It's all around. And if we don't know our enemy, it's harder to trust where our victory will come from. So name it. That here, even on Palm Sunday, we're mindful, yes, of Hosanna. Yes, of declaration. Yes, the King has come. Yes, to be on that road. Oh, to, to lay my cloak down. People so committed to the scriptures that th- this idea of Messiah, which they'd been reading and waiting for, it's like they're laying down their own cloak in order to usher in the high king of heaven. Oh, what a day. But how in the world did five days later they say crucify him? How did they go from Hosanna to crucify? Because there is evil. It's in the world. And I don't know about you, but it's in me too. It's what it means to be, yes, saved in faith, but yes, the reality of my flesh is constantly pulling me away from the anchor point of the Father's heart into experiences with evil. So when we pray out what Jesus says here, deliver us from the evil one, we're saying, Lord, help us. We will all struggle at times with different experiences, But at our place of greatest need for safety, prayer teaches us to depend on the Father, the good Father, the Father's heart. Ephesians 6, 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and against forces. And so the enemy is is our reality. As Pete Gregg says in his book on prayer, he says in prayer, we're learning to rule and reign with Christ. And so as we pray, We're putting Satan in his place. But it's a battle. And I'm very worried with a modern Christianity that divorces our faith from the promise of heaven or the reality of evil. We start to look like a watered down YMCA without the pool and facilities. Friends, we're in a battle for the Lord to reign here. And we know how it ends, but it doesn't mean that Satan's not after our faith and after our kids and after our relationships, after our church, it's real. I mean, Martin Luther, all the, all the years ago in, in the Reformation, he says, Satan's opposed to the church. The best thing we can do, therefore, is to put our fists together and pray. That's how we fight. That's how we, that's how we face the struggles of evil. The Father can provide safety from even evil, even as we are called to rail against it. That's what the heroes of the Christian faith did. They put their fists together and they prayed. And they walked out a bold faith, pushing back against the evil of the, of the enemy in bold declaration of the goodness of Christ. One kind of hero of the faith to me, and this time of year I think about his great bonfire, is St. Patrick, who himself was taken as a slave and brought uh, by feudal lords to Ireland, which was a very pagan nation in the time before Patrick was there. He was young, he was turned into a shepherd in the fields, and he spent, like David uh, in, in the book of Samuel, he spent days and days and days and days alone. And it was there as a shepherd he cultivated a daily act of prayer. Lord, lead me. Lord, thank you. Lord, care for me. Lord, I love you. He spoke to the Father. It's what prayer does. Patrick became changed by the Spirit of God and transformed in his prayer life. And he wrote later, he said, I could see the Spirit was then fervent on me, and as his Spirit grew in him, the evil came into greater attack of him. Now, somebody else said this. I love it. The enemy doesn't break into empty houses. 
the enemy doesn't break into empty houses. What does that mean? It means at your place of growing significance for the Father, for the kingdom, as a person of good, you will face increased attack here on earth. Absolutely. If the enemy doesn't break into empty houses, so when you're facing enemy attack, in some regards, it's a confirmation that you might be ready for a breakthrough. Because you might be experiencing some, some dissonance from the enemy because he's trying to distract and disqualify you from the work that God's calling you to. So in the midst of your great evil attacks, that's when you name the power of Jesus and you, learn into, you lean into your prayer. So Patrick was experiencing this, this great attack from, from Satan. He would have these nightmares at night. And the feudal kings in this kind of paganistic culture, they warned Patrick, at, at the time of Easter approached. There'd be no bonfires in the land because of our pagan gods and the little dwarfs and things that they were into there. And Patrick wouldn't take no for an answer. He wouldn't stop declaring Jesus. It, it didn't try to be disrespectful to the Druids and the fairy magic, but as the king threatened to kill him or lock him up, Patrick climbed to the tallest hill he could find, the hill of slain, and built the biggest bonfire he could muster up as a declaration that this Jesus, his king of heaven, the father whose name he hallowed, was bigger than any evil that Patrick faced. And as that bonfire burned on the hill of slain, it's told later that all of Ireland was changed by its warmth, changed by its impact. This is what on earth as it is in heaven, Christians do. They're bonfire builders. They're pushing back against the evil of the enemy. They're saying, lead me not into my own temptation. Help me understand my own failures. But God, would your victory mark my life? And evil is a reality. It's like, oh, okay, thanks, God. It's helpful in a 1,600-year-old illustration. Make it more relevant. Even for me in the last year, as my authority at church increased, and Heather and I tuned into the Spirit more and said, Lord, reign in our lives, in our homes, before we do anything out of this. Bam, we started experiencing some serious evil in our neighborhood. We had stalkers and our home broken into, and then in our own home. And a couple of my kids had these horrible nightmares with really graphic detail and wasn't connected at all to some movie we watched forever. And they'd wake up screaming at the exact same time of the night. And it happened to me. And then it happened to Heather. And we, I was talking to my spiritual director. I said, will you pray for this? Because I need some power here. He's like, you're under attack, my friend. Like, why are you so slow to name the evil that's trying to distract and disqualify you? And it's like, oh, we're all distracted at our place of greatest fear. I have this great fear about my kids being hurt. Because I lost a child. I just told God, like, I don't know if I could do that again. I'll believe in you till anything, but please, can you just protect my kids? But then when the attack became in my home and felt personal and my kids were struggling, I was scared. So we prayed. And we didn't deny the evil one. We gathered our kids up. We're like, guys, we're gonna do something a little bit different. My kids are teenagers. One's in college. One's in junior high. Those aren't ages where we love doing spiritual activities in our front yard to break off the curses of evil. <laughs> it's just not something we did a lot. But we did it. We went out to the corner of our, of, of our lot and we took communion. And the kids were like, this is different. <laughs> we're gonna name evil. And we're going to bind it by the power of the Holy Spirit away from this home. And we took communion and we poured some communion juice onto the corner of the land and we prayed for Jesus' power to protect my kids. And then we did that three more times. And the nightmares ended. They ended. So listen. And then life happens and there's struggles and, you know, like it's going to always be hard. And there's always a war for our spirit that like this week's the worst week ever because Satan's constantly trying to distract us from the Father's heart. There is evil in the world. But Jesus is bigger. We have this victory. And that's where I wanted to conclude. That that's as we close this series, it's about becoming a praying church, naming ourselves as praying people. Prayer is winning the battle for our hearts. And the name of battle is that there'll be another battle. But in today's battle, that prayer helps us by saying, yes, Lord, yes, I believe, yes. You know why we pray amen at the end of a prayer? It's actually a Hebrew word which means, yes, we believe, may it be so. And Jesus didn't specifically end the Lord's prayer with amen, but I just have a hunch, he looked at his closest friends, he's like, 
Amen. Richard next week is gonna talk in an Easter message about the power and the kingdom and the glory of God, which is a lot of ways how we end the Lord's Prayer. And if you want kind of an awkward experience at Bethany Community Church, say, hey, let's get 10 of us together and pray the Lord's Prayer together because we all say it a little bit different. But I think our diversity is a great gift because we come from different traditions. So you say debts and I say temptations and you say evil one and I say the kingdom, the power. It's a gift. But as Jesus concludes the Lord's Prayer, we're reminded our victory is continuing to lean into being people of prayer. Jesus himself said at the end of the story in Revelation 3, I stand at the door and knock. If any man or woman hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into them. I will be with them. I will sup with them and they will be with me. And so prayer leads us into the realm of the powers of the Father and the safety of the Father and the victory for life triumphant in Christ filled with his spirit where Christ is alive in us, where he's greater than our worries, greater than our pain, greater than our hurts. I didn't wanna end today so focused on our temptations and evil where I didn't get to remind you that Jesus is bigger. He's bigger. He's more powerful. He has more authority. He leads us in a place of provision and safety. This is how the story ends. You turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20, get to the very, very end. At the very, very end, it says, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. As Christians, we know the future. We know the evil one will be eviscerated. The one who speak words of hatred and shame and addiction and brokenness, he'll be vanquished. He'll be put under Jesus' foot and the Lord will establish his rule on earth as it is in heaven. We will be provided for. Our hearts will be bound to his. I, with my 10-year-old, I'm reading the Chronicles of Narnia again and as Lewis says at the end of his story, the dream is over, this is the morning See, we're, we're a praying church and we're praying by the power of God's name that his name would be lifted high in our life. And that's why we're, we're kicking off this 24-7 prayer as a church, all six locations covering all 167 hours from now through Easter. There's still a few spots if you wanna join us. We're just saying the most effective thing we can do this week is not you know, gussy up our tulips for next Sunday or bake our muffins. We'll do those things too, but we're gonna be people praying for God to move and the church leading into the authority that comes by the hallowed name of the Father. So the temptations will come, and the obstacles we face will be many, but the Spirit alive in us can lead us over victory, over every obstacle, every evil. I said it earlier, and I think I'll close with this, is that Every one of us is tempted at our own place of brokenness and our own need. You have a different story than me, different, and we could have some fun here. It's like, hey, let's stand up and talk about our places of brokenness. That would be hard. And some traditions actually do it. They do shared confession circles. It would be good for us. For me, I have this desire to see God move in the city, but sometimes I don't know where my ministry stops and God's begins. So I'm tempted at a place of pride or arrogance, or need for validation or significance. And just a couple years ago, the men from Bethany went up to a camp up in, uh, a Young Life camp at Malibu that some leaders from this church and others put on every year pre-COVID called Men's Malibu. And we were going up there to have this time of intimacy with the Lord. But again, my place of temptation is around significance and, and validation And it was no longer than when we had gotten off the boat, and I'm there as a leader, we're there as a church, I'm doing a seminar, it's, you know, all this, I'm feeling great, and then the enemy just whispers shame into my ears. We walked past the the, the disc frisbee course, he's like, remember you were here last year with your son, and you were so busy, you and Heather, teaching marriage to to the guys in the camp that your son just wanted to play disc golf the whole time, and never did it. The ministry took priority over my family. That's, that's, a, that's evil. 
He spoke that to me. And then we got to the club room to like start worshiping. And it's just gorgeous up there if you haven't been. And I was like, hey, what happened to, you know, so-and-so, Gary, or, you know, it's not his name, but it's like, oh, no, he, he, he left the church. Yeah, no, they're, they're not involved, and da-da-da, and, you know, and, and all I heard was like, and you're a failure. You're trying to build a church, but yeah, it, it doesn't work in your home, and it doesn't work in the church, and everything's probably gonna come to ruin. And so as the men around me started to be led into worship, I was literally seated in, in just this pain of just shame, this black hole what the evil was coming to me, it was like speaking words of failure. And my temptation was to despair and not trusting God. And then the men started singing that, you know, this is how we fight our battles. Eric and some leaders from Bethany, they're singing it. And I'm like, yeah, I want to be in my shame. I want to be in my black hole. This is how we fight our battles. You know, it's like, can you guys be quiet? I'm in a black hole here, you know. <laughs> this is how we fight our battles. Because that song just says that same line over and over and over again. But in this time, I needed it. This is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight. Oh, there's a battle for your heart right now. Because you can redeem things with Kincaid. And, and Gary's going to be okay but don't miss the blessing of this moment. And do not think for a moment that you're not being tempted and not facing evil. Come and pray to me. Come and worship me. Come and hallow my name. Come and lay your idols before me and be formed as a man after my own heart. That's all I care about. I just, I just love you, says the Lord. And you spend so much time obsessing and chasing something else. Let me love you. Let me love you. And then finally, I'm able to start singing with the men around me, and it was just a game changer. And I entered into the banquet that Jesus had set for me, hallowing his name. That's what becoming praying people looks like. And we'll fail, and then we'll do it again. And then we'll be tempted, and then we'll turn to God. And then we'll face evil, and then we'll turn again. Because that's the trajectory of people formed by his hope in this world. We pray with you now, Jesus, thank you so much for this moment to consider your scriptures and your gospel. God, we love you so much. We lift your name high. God, we, we, we honor you. And we're mindful here on Palm Sunday, you're a good father. You came for us to restore us and bring us to life. God, we're laying cloaks on the road. Uh, allow us to not be cynical, to not look towards Good Friday quite yet. But today, God, we are Messiah people. We need you, God. We are at the end of ourself and our own strength. So help us understand our temptations. God, help us name the evil that so easily entangles and help us hallow your name, be lifted high. People moving into participation, people of prayer, changing the city with our fists clenched in prayer. God, we love you and all God's people said, amen. As we finish here and we sing here in just a moment, I'm gonna call our prayer team members for if there's anybody to pray. I'm gonna just invite us to just 30 seconds of silent prayer. We think about prayer a lot, but we're actually becoming praying people. So all of us here as we hallow the Lord's name and then go into our final song, we have some different options. Father, your name be lifted high, silently. You're not writing, you're not drawing, you're not performing, you're just connecting to the heart of the Father. This is about him loving you. Just name one thing and just bring that to him. Father, only you can help me in my battle of blank. It's a prayer of adoration. Name it, pray. Father, I love you. Heal me in my battle of blank. That's a moment of confession. Father, your name is holy. Will you help blank in their battle? That's intercession. Father, give me blank to help me, to help lead me today. That's a petition. Give me this daily bread. Father, you're good. Fill me with your power of my battle with blank and just say that over and over in meditation. Pick one. Do it alone. As you're, when you're ready, as you look over that and the Spirit kind of convicts you which one, then bow your head, close your eyes. And let's be a praying church together and we'll go into our final song.